Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks for joining us. Our first story is all about the empty shelves that we're all seeing in stores, record-breaking backlogs at our ports, and a severe shortage of truck drivers. The breakdown in our supply chain is hurting the economy. And if you haven't already, you're about to feel the pinch in your wallet. So what steps is the White House taking to break the logjam? Senior Washington correspondent Tara Mergener explains. The White House and businesses from coast to coast are warning the supply headaches will get even worse as the holidays approach and demand gets higher. And this year, prices will no doubt be higher too. To help get things moving again, the president says he's brokered an agreement for the Port of Los Angeles to become a 24-hour, seven days a week operation. You're hearing a lot about something called supply chains and how hard it is to uh, get a range of things from a toaster to sneakers to bicycles. Big retailers and shipping companies are also pledging to expand their hours. President Biden meeting with Walmart, UPS and Home Depot. This is the first key step toward moving our entire freight, transportation, and logistical supply chain nationwide to a 24-7 system. L.A. and Long Beach ports account for 40 percent of shipping containers that enter the U.S., both suffering from record-breaking backlogs. What happens with the railroads in the Midwest and warehouses across the country affects the number of ships that everyone sees out here in the harbor. High consumer demand, plus a shortage of truck drivers. We're about three hours late. All this is jacking up shipping costs. A year ago, it cost $1,900 to use a container. Now it's costing $16,000 because they're using the container for storage on the ships and in the ports. And adding up to higher prices at the checkout line. They are passing all these expenses on to the consumer. They have no choice. So we haven't even begun to see the inflation that is gonna come from all of this. Factory workers and other supply chain issues are also keeping many items off store shelves with shortages expected to continue through the holidays. To keep your shelves full, we have to order eight weeks in advance, eight to six weeks. Basically what I've been telling people to do is start shopping early, uh, even be before Halloween. But the Treasury Secretary is telling Americans not to panic. I think there's no reason for consumers to panic about the absence of goods that they're going to want to acquire at Christmas. The latest inflation reading shows it edged up again last month to 5.4 percent with the biggest increases in food, shelter and gas. Now, according to a bank rate survey, 89 percent of Americans now notice these higher prices at the cash register and 66 percent say they are hurting financially because of them. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, there's nothing quite like uh, a member of our government, uh, and, and this one, the head of the Federal Reserve, telling us not to panic. It, it just induces panic when you hear that come out of, out of her mouth. It, it, we, it, this is unbelievable what's happening in our economy. And it's not just the goods in the store, and it's not just the empty shelves. It's not just the supply chain. If you go to the gas station today, get ready for some sticker shock, and I've got some bad news for you. If you depend on natural gas for heating, uh, get to pre be prepared to pay a lot higher rate coming in this winter. Natural gas prices have increased 100% since January. Uh, so that's a doubling, and oh, the, the, it seems like there's more to come. It's good news. The administration is, is paying attention to it, but is it too little, too late? And how can you get rid of this kind of backlog? And how does the federal government induce people to drive trucks and, and deal with supply chain issues? Uh, this is a really incredible situation we're in. And get ready for more inflation. In other news, is it safe and effective to mix and match COVID vaccines? A new study suggests it is, with some boosters more effective than others. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. As you were just saying, a new study from the National Institutes of Health says mixing and matching vaccines does appear to be safe and effective. 
The study suggests that those who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine benefited more from boosters made by Pfizer and Moderna. It also found those who were vaccinated with Pfizer or Moderna vaccines and took boosters from other companies still showed a strong immune response. Officials caution, though, the study, which is yet to be peer-reviewed, is based on a small sample size. An FDA panel meeting today and tomorrow will consider authorization of boosters for both J&J &J and Moderna. Well, here in Washington, Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid met with Secretary of State Antony Blinken Wednesday. His top priority, the ongoing threat from Iran. Every delay in the negotiations brings Iran closer to a nuclear bomb. The Iranians are clearly dragging the hills, trying to cheat the world, to continue to enrich uranium, to develop their ballistic missile program. If a terror regime is going to acquire a nuclear weapon, we must act. We must make clear that the civilized world won't allow it. Now, Israel disagrees with the Biden administration's efforts to restart nuclear negotiations with Iran, but Lapid says Israel's security is something both nations view as a top priority. The two diplomats also discussed progress in the Abraham Accords signed last year. Well, one year after those accords were signed, Israel's Knesset is moving to make sure those agreements survive the test of time. CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The establishment here at the Knesset of the Abraham Accords Caucus is the next step in solidifying the relationship between Israel and her Sunni Arab neighbors. Caucus co-chair Ruth Wasserman Lande says leaders across Israel's political spectrum are uniting behind the accords. And as you could see, you had people from former government, current government. The fact that this is a real national interest of the country and of the region, and I pray to God that this is just the beginning. Bahrain's ambassador shared his country's support for expanding and protecting the accords. It can become the mechanism that enables us, despite the differences, to put our hands together and work towards one goal, a safer, more prosperous and secure Middle East. The event brought together many architects of the accords, like Jared Kushner, who says the peace agreements have started a ripple effect. It's spreading throughout the Middle East, it's spreading throughout the world. Muslims in Indonesia, Muslims in Saudi Arabia, Muslims in Malaysia, Muslims in Pakistan, they're seeing that Israel is not what they've been told it is, and they're seeing that Israelis are welcoming their Muslim brothers, and they're seeing that there's a lot that we could be doing together. This Bahraini shares a unique perspective after working with Israelis. This is my first visit, but it's not my first interaction with Israeli people. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a humanitarian, so I do a lot of work internationally, and uh, luckily enough, I had the pleasure to meet a lot of Israelis around the world who are volunteering with me as well. And to me, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're great people. U.S. representatives pledge support to advance the accords. The Biden administration now continues working to expand normalization efforts and to deepen Israel's existing relationships and to bring new countries into the fold. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu credited the Trump administration for changing policy towards Israel and Arab leaders. They understood now that the road to Washington passed not through Ramallah, but through Jerusalem, because that was the American policy. They said, if you want even better relations with the United States, then make peace with Israel. So the change in American policy was critical. I have to say that without it, you know, you could bake the cake, but you can't finish it. You can't put the topic on it without this crucial change. Netanyahu added, while Israel and the Sunni Arab nations face a common enemy, he's optimistic about the future. I believe that if we continue to move in this direction, and if we don't fall into yesterday's traps and the failed policy of the past, our grandchildren will look back at this moment and say that the peace of Abraham brought the sons of Abraham together. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Knesset, Jerusalem. Thank you, Chris. Gordon, it is amazing to witness this undeniable reshaping of the Middle East. Well, it actually has gone against what our own State Department was saying for a very long period of time. And I have to congratulate Ambassador David Friedman. I think he was one of the principal architects of this wonderful Abraham Accords. And also the transfer of our embassy uh, from outside Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, something that the foreign policy establishment said was never going to happen. 
Let's go back to the Clinton administration, 1996. That's when Congress passed a law mandating that the U.S. Embassy be in Jerusalem. But it had an out within the law that if the administration thought for security concerns it wasn't advisable to do it, you could kick the can down the road. Well, Clinton kicked the can. Bush kicked the can. Every president since kicked the can. And then finally, under Trump, the, the embassy moved. Now, the prediction from the so-called experts was there would be an eruption, that there would be bloodshed, there would be all these riots, and the whole Middle East would go up in flames, all this. None of that happened. The same thing with the Abraham Accords. John Kerry, our Secretary of State, said you cannot have piecemeal peace. You have to first solve the Palestinian question, and then you can broker peace with the other nations. Well, the Trump administration turned all of that around with the Abraham Accords, and now we're seeing the fruit of it. And it's wonderful to see. If you think peace with the Palestinians is possible, please think again. They've been offered a state of every, every single peace deal since 1948, and they've never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They have no intention of establishing a separate Palestinian state. Their every attention, their every statement since 1948 has been to drive the Jews into the sea, to abolish the state of Israel. Let's take them at their word, and in that, isolate them from the international community. Israel has a right to exist, and let's stand with her in that right. Israel stands alone as the world's only Jewish state and the lone democracy in a sea of Middle East dictatorships. It's also the most misunderstood country on earth, according to Noah Tishby. This actress, now turned author, is on a personal mission to spread the truth about Israel around the globe. Take a look. While not well known by American audiences, actress, producer, and activist Noah Tishby is a household name in her homeland. Born and raised in Tel Aviv, Noah got her start in the Israeli entertainment industry as a teenager. Over the years, she's appeared in many of Israel's leading TV, film, theater, and ad campaigns. When she moved to Hollywood, however, Noah realized most people she encountered in America knew little about Israel's history and culture. Others she met held misconceptions about the Jewish state. To set the record straight, Noah has written a book, Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth. Well, Noah joins us now. Welcome to the 700 Club. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. T tell us about your experience in L.A. Here, here you go from <laughs> trying to make it in the entertainment industry yeah. in Tel Aviv, <laughs> uh, and then you're, you get told this wonderful, if, if you want to make wine, you need to be in France. If you oh. want to make movies, oh, you need to be in L.A. You. So you move to L.A., yeah. and you now discover something that you weren't ready for. Yeah, so I um, started my career in the entertainment industry in Israel at a very young age and was very blessed and had great success over there. Age 12. Yeah, or eight, depends on what you start oh, counting. Okay. <laughs> Started doing and your parents didn't know? My parents didn't know, but I always say that if you have a child that has a, a calling, you can't stop that child. So mm. they were very, um, they were just like, okay, go ahead and, and do what you want to do. So I started my career in the entertainment industry and was very self-centered in that way and didn't think much about um, Israel or the Jewish people or what does that mean spiritually to be Jewish and to be an Israeli. And then I moved to Los Angeles. I did great in Israel and entertainment. I moved to Los Angeles to pursue my career in entertainment and then I started encountering the severe misunderstandings about Israel and I come from a political family so my mom always jokes that my DNA kicked in and I found myself in this position of explaining to people about Israel and telling them like no 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 it's not okay Hamas is not actually Hezbollah and there's you know here are the borders this is what happened and I found myself in this position of explaining to people what Israel is about and throughout the years took it professionally and then I wrote this book and the reason I wrote this book is because Israel's safety and security it's not a Jewish people issue mm. it's not an Israeli people issue it's a U.S. national security issue mm. and Western civilization issue. So as I'm sure you know and a lot of your viewers know, Israel's a stabilizing force within the Middle East. 
and there's no negating the indigenous justification, the moral justification, the historical justification of the existence of the state of Israel in the land of Israel. And I just couldn't sit still and watch people not know what they're talking about while having a lot of opinions about it. <laughs> which is the worst. Like, if you don't know anything about it, just don't talk. And I, um, I just had to do something about it, so I wrote this book. L.A. also awakened in you uh, a desire to learn more about your Jewish heritage. Yeah, I Because uh, you were raised I secular. I was, I was. And it was getting a phone call. We're celebrating <laughs> Rosh Hashanah, yeah. if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and, you and you read the book. Yeah, I did. <laughs> this is great. Uh, and and why? why? Why did L.A. start that in? Um, I think that once you take uh, a, a fish out of water, they start realizing what the water actually was. So the story mm. is that I, I was... Um, you know, or you move the fish to another fishbowl, and they kind of look and go, oh, there's another fishbowl there, right? Um, I was in L.A. a few months, and I was, uh, I got a phone call one morning from my family, and they all went, happy holidays, and I went, okay, happy holidays, what holiday is it? And said, oh, it's Rosh Hashanah, and I completely forgot that it was Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. and my, my heart sank, and I, what it brought me to is to re-examine what it means to be Jewish? What is the spiritual teaching that the Jewish people have been given and what is my responsibility if I don't live in Israel and I don't have it kind of surrounded, you know, every day and not celebrating Rosh Hashanah because everybody is celebrating Rosh Hashanah. If, it's, if I live out of Israel, what does that mean to be Jewish? What is the spiritual calling? What is the, um, what is the responsibility that I have as a human being to pass this information onwards? And it was a great place to start as a secular person because I looked at it from kind of like a, a spiritual point of view, a uh, um, scientific point of view, a family-oriented point of view, and I found a lot of incredibly inspiring answers through this journey, which mm -hmm which brought me to this book as well. One of the things I've noticed, even with the, in, within the secular community of Israel, uh, which is pronounced, particularly in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. um, that they, they all universally buy into the thought that Israel is to be a light to the nations. Yeah. Why is that? I think that um, one of the most powerful mandates that uh, Jewish people have, and it's something that's in you, whether you're secular or super religious, is the mandate of tikkun olam. Mm -hmm. So making the world a better place is something that is kind of ingrained in Jewish culture, in a way, uh, in a lot of other cultures as well, obviously. But that is something that I believe that people in Israel um, do feel that responsibility. Like, we need to strive to be um, just a little better and just, you know, make the world better. And this is very apparent by, for example, the amount of startup companies and um, academic papers and, you know, the all, the, all these blessing. things that, yeah, you that know, Israel we... contributes to the world, which is completely disproportionate to its size. So definitely punching above well, its weight. Well, the amount of humanitarian work Israelis do and volunteer yeah, for on a regular yeah. basis and go to like 130 countries mm -hmm. uh, to provide humanitarian aid. Uh, they're def definitely, to... you know, a country the size of New Jersey doing that yeah. much yeah. humanitarian work is, is really surprising. Let me turn to the, the real meat of your book, and I I'm, I'm really applaud you for digging into the boycott divestment sanction right. movement and <laughs> following the yeah. money on that. Yeah. So here you have a country whose very uh, ideology, if you will, is we're to be a light to the nations. Mm -hmm. And now they're being accused of being an apartheid state, of oppression, uh, things that are yeah, all of these cleansing. things. What's the what's the origin of that? Mm. So this is a little um, a little complicated, but I go in depth into this in the into in my book uh, in a movement called the BDS movement, which is stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, which is an, a movement that's trying to brand Israel an apartheid state. Obviously, all the facts negate that. This originated um, over 20 years ago in the Durban Conference Against Racism, mm -hmm. which was so anti-Semitic that the United States and Israel actually walked pulled out. that. Yeah, walked out. Exactly. And refused to participate. To yeah, this day. yeah, obviously. So this is where this language originated. Now, here's the thing to understand: Israel's enemies have tried to destroy her first with military, with other countries, then with terrorism 
with, you know, terrorist attacks and uh, airplanes attacks. Both of these didn't work. And then they shifted their tactics from actual attacking the country to what I call in the book a slow-moving terrorist attack, which is delegitimizing Israel's right to exist as the homeland of the Jewish people. And they came up with this language trying to um, shake the foundation of Israel's legitimacy. And I would venture to say that they succeeded beyond their belief uh, at this point, but I'm, I'm here to fight it. So I would be very cautious if I'm a parent about a movement called BDS Movement and what they do to our kids on college campuses because well, they're why hiding... why they targeted the college campuses? Because, because they seem to be enormously yeah, successful. Absolutely. To my absolute amazement, yeah. Yale University, their, their student yeah. government passed a resolution supporting BDS. There are so many campuses in which they... they what they did is basically they concluded that young Americans are naive mm. and they shifted their work to college campuses and they, des they descend on college campuses in around voting season. And their intention, it's not even to pass the resolution because who cares if a university passes this or that resolution, right? It's about creating that resolution and that vote to begin with to become legitimate such that the college kids then walk out to the real world and go, oh, we voted against it on college, we can vote against it on in city council or in the elections. So that's what they're doing. They're funded by really bad people that needs to be investigated. Well, how, how did they get that funding? Because when you talk about every single college campus in the United mm -hmm. States and you're trying to change the minds of the future leaders of America, yeah, that's, voters, the, yeah. that's the intent, that, mm -hmm. that's what they're trying to do. You can't do that on a long, sustained basis without a ton of money. Mm -hmm. We're not talking a little bit, we're talking a lot. How are they getting that funding? I would encourage people to, um, to read my book. I go down a rabbit hole on this. Mm -hmm. There's a full-on chapter about BDS. There are also congressional hearings by a man called Jonathan Chasner, who is a terrorism finance expert, who did a very big, long dive into the sources of funding. This is something that the He's authorities... He's a former Treasury official. Yes, he is. And, and he it... was tasked with finding terror yeah. money yeah. and tracking it exactly. as a forensic accountant. Exactly. And he has been calling for FBI and IRS investigation for a very long time. So I hope to amplify his voice and voices like that to actually take this on because this is this is dangerous again for national security of the United States and for Western civilization everything we stand for all right I've got to ask yeah. because it's really bugging me how <laughs> is BDS infiltrating the Jewish community in America Ben and Jerry's was founded by two Jewish men mm -hmm. and they're now saying we're no longer going to sell ice cream in the West Bank. <laughs> and they're saying we're, we're, we can't be anti-Semitic because we're Jewish. How, how, how in the world did that happen? I, I believe that Ben and Jerry themselves are definitely not anti-Semites, but what they're doing is unknowingly working for anti-Semites and actually fulfilling on their wishes. So here's the thing with BDS. We live in a free country. Anybody can say what they want, okay? BDS is hiding their intention. So BDS is a movement that is after the dismantlement of the state of Israel as a Jewish state, period, end of story. The founder doesn't hide it. Their supporters and leaders don't find it. But what they do when they go to college, they don't say, um, let's dismantle a democratic right. state. Let's they drive, say they talk Israel about freedom and justice, right? That's what they talk about. And they dupe people to support them. A lot of them Jews who think that they're supporting some sort of a governmental policy, which we're all for. Mm -hmm. We all love democracy, but that's not what BDS is about. BDS is about dismantling the Jewish state and they should and need to be stopped. Do you have hope for peace in Israel? I definitely do. What, what gives you that hope? What gives me that is being on the ground in Israel and living there and growing up there. And when you go to Israel, you see that coexistence on the ground is way more powerful. And it's just, it's kind of like a seamless thing. We live through this all the time. So we know how to live together in peace. We know how to live together with our neighbors. Israel is the fruit of a tree that's roots are 3,500 years old and I believe that this is not going away anytime, that we have every possibility to live together in peace, and we will, as we still do. And let me echo that, yeah. as a Christian, 
the only nation in the Middle East where the Christian population is actually growing is Israel. Mm -hmm. And you look at what has happened in the West Bank to a little town called Bethlehem. That when I first visited there in 1969, mm -hmm. was 80% Christian. Today, under the Palestinian Authority, it's less than 20% Christian. The Christians have been driven out. Oh my God. Uh, so you look at the BDS saying it's an apartheid and it's oppressive and it's a genocide. Just look at what happened to the Jewish quarter from 1948 to 1967, where if you were Jewish, you couldn't possibly step foot in the Jewish quarter. Uh, it was illegal for you to do that. Mm. And all the synagogues were destroyed throughout the West Bank. So I'm with you on this. Anyway. Thank you so much. We, <laughs> we could talk a long time. The book is called <laughs> Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth. There's a caution here. The language can sometimes get a little salty, but that's okay. It's available wherever books are sold. So Noah, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. All right. Burning homes and churches, butchering, beheading, and crucifying Christians. In Mozambique, Heidi Baker lives and works under the constant threat of terror. So why does she stay in the middle of such evil? Take a look. Missionary Heidi Baker has served in Mozambique since 1995. It's one of the poorest countries on the planet. And in recent years, one of the most dangerous. Despite lethal terrorist attacks near her town, Heidi continues to spread the truth of the gospel. I'm telling you, in the midst of the tragedy, God is doing the most incredibly beautiful things. Co-founder of the humanitarian ministry, Iris Global, Heidi plans to keep meeting needs where God has called her. So Heidi, tell us, how did you get to Mozambique in, in the beginning? What, what was the start for you? As a brand new baby believer, a 16 year old, brand new born again believer in Jesus, I was fasting and praying as the church um, was calling me to fast and pray. And on the fifth day of a fast, I had an incredible experience with the Lord where I literally felt like I heard his voice calling me as a minister and a missionary to Africa, Asia, and England. And after being in Asia 12 years with my husband, Roland, in the UK for three years, uh, it was time for Africa. And Africa is this massive continent. And so we were praying again, where in Africa? And Roland said, they're blowing up Red Cross trucks in Mozambique. And immediately I said, perfect, we want to go there. That's where we want to go. Heidi, uh, I've, I've, uh, I look at the danger you're under, and uh, I know for a lot of people, they're saying, can, can we evacuate Heidi out of this? Um, tell us why you want to stay in the middle of some extreme danger. It's such, it's just such a joy to work with this beautiful, generous, powerful, anointed Mozambican team. And this is a lifelong calling for me. Um, we've been here, we're going on um, 29 years soon. This is the greatest joy of our lives. Um, to be here for such a time as this. There's nowhere in the world that we'd rather be than here in Northern Mozambique with the people who have adopted us. For people watching right now, what can we do to help you? What can we do to help the refugees from Northern Mozambique? Well, uh, we're feeding over 32,000 um, people a meal a day. Uh, so food aid is always a massive blessing for us, but always um, audio solar Bibles for the people to receive an audio Bible in their own local dialect. So if you can imagine, we're going out teams of 30 to 50 of us, 99% national Mozambicans, we're going to the camps um, the internally displaced people camps. We're going to the communities, uh, literally where people have lost everything. We're bringing them not only food aid and farming kits, but we're bringing them the word of God in their local dialect. 
So to be able to continue with that is a joy. The other thing is I want you all in America to learn from the Mozambican body of Christ. They are the most extraordinary people I've ever seen in terms of courage and generosity. Our pastors who have even had their own, one of our pastors, a four and a half year old child of his was, was, was beheaded. And another one lost their home. Uh, six churches burned to the ground. The, the way these men and women live, the first thing they do when others come is they say, welcome, and they just put them in their yards and they just share their food with the hungry. And they really are uh, examples for those in other parts of the world that maybe are afraid of the shaking times that are going on in the world and the shaking that's even about to increase in the world. And what Mozambicanos can teach you, what Mozambicans can teach you, and this is my prayer, is that, that you can fix your eyes on Jesus. Uh, last question, how can people pray for you? Pray that we would just grow even closer to Jesus. Pray with our Mozambican brothers and sisters that we would finish well. And um, they knew that I was going to do this program. And they asked for, for me to ask you to pray that they would have courage and that all of us would, would finish well, that we would bring glory to the Lord with our little lives laid down for his sake. He is worthy of it all. Heidi, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. And I, I love the, your, your attitude. God is doing beautiful things. Thank you for what you're doing. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Police say a Danish man suspected of a bow and arrow attack in Norway killed five people, and they're describing him as a Muslim convert who'd been flagged as radicalized. The man, suspected of shooting people in a number of locations in a small town Wednesday evening, four women and one man were killed. The suspect reportedly told the police that he was responsible. A parish priest remarked afterwards, nobody could have imagined this could happen here in our little town. Well, a Colombian nun gained her freedom after being held captive by jihadists for five years. Sister Gloria Cecilia Navarez was taken hostage along with three other nuns while serving as a missionary in the West African nation of Mali. After her release, Sister Gloria thanked the Mali government for securing her freedom, saying, quote, I'm very happy I stayed healthy for five years. Thank God. Efforts reportedly are underway to free the remaining nuns held hostage. Mali has been fighting an Islamic insurgency in the north. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. After a hurricane hit, Kathy and Dennis took one look at their house. It seemed as if, quote, the walls were melting and mold was everywhere. Well, before long, their house was torn down to the studs. Insurance wouldn't cover the rebuild. So Kathy and Dennis had to live in their garage. Shortly after Dennis and Kathy Dorman moved to Florida to retire, Category 5 Hurricane Michael made landfall on the Florida Panhandle. They evacuated and had no idea what to expect when they returned home. The walls were, looked like they were melting, it just like they were just disintegrating. The house was destroyed from the inside. The walls and the ceiling, everything had to come out. Once we started finding mold, we thought maybe it would be isolated, it wasn't. The more we pulled, the more we found. It all had to come out. Insurance covered removing some of the infected drywall, but not doing the rebuild. Dennis had ongoing health problems that were getting worse. It didn't help that they had to move into their garage. We had to use the bathroom in a five gallon bucket. I mean, that was what we had, that was our bathroom. But at our age, you, you really start to think, Lord, are we gonna have to spend the rest of our days living in this garage? Yeah, you know, my husband was a really depressed at that time because he knew he couldn't do anything because of his health. And that took a toll on him greatly. Dennis decided to talk to God about it. I said, Father, I can't do this. I can't fix this. I can't do it. Would you please do it? 
The impression that I felt in my spirit was, okay, all you had to do is ask. Kathy and Dennis didn't know how they were going to recover, but they continued to trust in God. Inspired by their dedication and faith, Pastor Cole of Lighthouse Church gave them a chance to share their testimony. Hey, God told me, trust me, trust me. We never stopped tithing all through the hurricane, loss of jobs, loss of health. We never stopped. We trusted. So that night I went online and I posted my payment to the church, my 10%, and what I had left over, I paid what bills we could. The next morning I get a call. Praise God. I get a call from Operation Blessing. They said, we want to rebuild your house. All of a sudden, all these trucks pull up and people are working and it was just unbelievable. A ray of light broke through. We were smiling and laughing. I had something to be excited about. We had hope. With the support of Operation Blessing donors and volunteers, our team removed the mold, put in new drywall, floors, ceilings, and kitchen cabinets, and refinished two bathrooms. Sometimes my husband and I just open the door and walk in and we just, we just start crying. Everything smells good. Everything is beautiful. You think about heaven and what heaven will be like. And I think that God gave us a taste of what heaven will be like. People loving you, working together, wanting you to have the best. I mean, you, you say thank you. You say those words. But thank you could never be enough. Never be enough for what was given to us. 700 Club members, I hope that touches your heart because you are the ones who make it possible for Operation Blessing to be in situations like this. I want you to just put yourself in Kathy and Dennis's place for a moment. Imagine if that was you, your house destroyed, totally pulled apart, and insurance doesn't cover rebuilding it, and you don't have the capacity to do it. And, you know, hope does run dry at times like that, doesn't it? It just seems impossible. And yet, I want to say over and over again, we hear people who are in these disaster situations say, and then the Operation Blessing truck showed up coming down my street. Some of them were people who over the years have been 700 club members, never realizing that one day those trucks would come their way. The work that Operation Blessing does is just one of the things that you support when you become a 700 Club member. There's so much more here at home, as you saw with Dennis and Kathy, but also around the world. We want to invite the rest of you to be a part of that. If you haven't joined, it's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you can make a huge difference. Our number's toll free to call. It's so simple, 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, can I join the 700 Club? We've got club levels you can join at. A general membership is what I mentioned to you, but you could become a 700 Club Gold member at $40 a month or join our 1,000 Club at $84 a month. Ask God what he'd have you to do. Then call and join today and experience the satisfaction of knowing the kind of blessing you just saw is what will be your fruit from your faithfulness. We want to say thank you. And by the way, when you call and you join the 700 Club, would you do it using Pledge Express? It's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. It's pretty wonderful, actually. You can stop at any time you want, but it saves us some administrative costs. So even more of your gift can be put right into the work of Operation Blessing, of Orphan's Promise, of all of the things that happen around the world here at CBN. We say thank you to you, and we're going to send you two things. First of all, for joining the 700 Club, we want you to have this DVD, The Nearness of Heaven. It's spectacular. People on here who have died, gone to heaven and come back to tell what that experience has been like. And then if you use Pledge Express, every month, Power for Life teaching is coming your way. So call now. We'll get this out to you right away. Squealing tires, a roaring engine, and a black SUV barreling through a parking lot and running over a young woman. Eddie Wilson was an eyewitness to this brutal crime. What's even worse, the victim was Eddie's coworker and friend. 
I had 911 on the phone and fully expected to find a, a, a dead body there in the parking lot. Her body was broken and bruised and, and just not laying in a normal way. I thought there's no way that anyone would ever be able to get up and walk from something like this ever again. It was just the most traumatic thing I've ever seen in my life. September 13, 2011. Eddie Wilson was returning to work after a walk on his lunch break. As he approached the building, something caught his attention. I heard the squeal of a car over uh, to the right, and I look over and there's a big, huge black SUV just squealing its tires and taking off out of the parking lot. Just moments earlier, inside the SUV, his coworker, Whitney Weiser, just broke up with her abusive boyfriend. Now, as she walked away from his car, he hit the gas and sped towards her. And then the next thing I knew is that the SUV absolutely plowed into her. And then I heard the sound and saw her as she was underneath the SUV and the tires were going over her. And at that point, I could not process what I was seeing because you're not supposed to see things like that. Eddie called 911 as he ran down to Whitney's broken body lying on the pavement. You could tell that she was in tremendous pain. And at that point, there was absolutely nothing else I could do but to grab her hand and pray with her right there on the spot. Whitney struggled to breathe as she clung to life. She had several severe injuries, including a broken back and cracked ribs. She was rushed to Vanderbilt Medical Center. Dr. R.J. Harris was one of her physicians. I was on the way to see her, looked at her chart, and I, I was really surprised that she was still alive after reading what had happened. She was in pretty bad shape. Meanwhile, Deanna Wall, a pastor at Whitney's church, arrived at the hospital to pray for her. I looked down on the gurney at a beautiful person who was battered, bleeding, broken. I got down as close as I could and I told her, I said, Whitney, God's got plans for your life and he's going to bring you through this. You hang on. Whitney had been a rising star in bodybuilding competitions. After her emergency spinal surgery, it was unclear if she would ever compete again or even be able to walk. I just didn't want to eat. I did not want to even try to walk um, just because of the level of pain that I was in. And I still, like, I just didn't understand that. Coming from bodybuilding and just strength training, it's like, I'm invincible, right? She began physical therapy with the same determination that brought her success in bodybuilding. Over the next weeks, she went from walking a few steps a day to walking a few hours a day. She says she put her life and future in God's hands. I had 100% faith and trust in him that I didn't understand why that happened or why it had to happen, but I trusted him that I was going to be okay. I also, within a couple weeks of it happening, I was able to forgive um, my ex-boyfriend for doing that, which clearly was not me, that's God because being able to forgive somebody that tried to take your life and everything from you, it's, I feel like it's not humanly possible to forgive that that fast. And so that was God 100%. Despite her broken back, Whitney trained hard and miraculously became stronger than before. She even returned to the bodybuilding stage at the top level, the Olympia. Not just that I got to the biggest stage and best stage in the world, but because I did it after what happened. And that's, I mean, that's a miracle. That's God. And that's God takes <laughs> the most broken people to do things with. And so that's what I feel like his purpose was for it. It's a miracle. It really is. The fact that she's walking through life with health, that she's walking through health with forgiveness, that she's walking through a life with a purpose and a meaning and doing this all through her faith and her passion for the Lord. It's just an amazing thing. Through this experience, Whitney discovered God's purpose for her life. She started her own bodybuilding show, encouraging women to overcome their challenges like she did with the power of God. When I tell people my story, it's like all barriers come down, all walls come down. 
and they're open and they're like, if she went through that, I can go through this. So it's just, it's empowering. God brought me back so much stronger that I made it to the Olympia. And I was on a stage with the best athletes in the entire world after that. So the power of God. <laughs> what an incredible story. And for Whitney to be able to forgive her attacker, what an incredible thing. That, and, and she acknowledges, well, this wasn't me, this was God. And the miracle that she's able to come back from horrific injury uh, to perform at the highest level is absolutely incredible. And that's God. For with God, nothing is impossible. In our own effort, when we look at things in the natural, we can usually come to the conclusion, this isn't possible, you can't do this. But keep that in your mind, in your heart, in your innermost being. With God, all things are possible. Well, it's my favorite time of the show where we get to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other miracle stories. Here's Buzz. He, he wrote in by email a month ago. My wife and I were watching the 700 Club. Pat and Terry were praying for healing. My left knee was close to the stage of needing a replacement. I asked my wife to lay her hand on it, and we both prayed with Terry for healing. Now, a month later, I have almost no pain, just normal old age soreness. Who doesn't have that? I went from having agonizing days where walking was a challenge to not even having a bother. Praise God, for he is good and faithful. That's awesome. This is Anna. She lives in Tompkinsville, Kentucky. She suffered with asthma and COPD. After she contracted COVID-19 in 2020, she had to start using supplemental oxygen. She doesn't usually watch the 700 Club, but she felt compelled to tune in on September the 13th of this year. During the prayer segment, Gordon, you said, we lift up anyone who's suffering with breathing problems. We command it in Jesus' name to leave them. Anna believed the prayer was for her. She immediately stopped wheezing, could breathe freely, and she no longer needs extra oxygen. Oh, hallelujah. That's what Jesus would do. He would command things. So let's do that right now. You just heard Buzz say, well, my wife laid his, her hand on my knee and, and we prayed in agreement and things happened. And then you hear this other wonderful story, breathing problems command. Let's do that. Let's do the same thing. I believe when you follow what the Bible spells out to do and you repeat <laughs> that, you'll get the same result. So let's do that. First, let's believe. Then in faith, let's lay hands. And then let's speak to it. Let's command it in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift everyone who's having sickness, anyone who's having pain, anyone with breathing problems, anyone with problems with their knees or their shoulders or their elbows or their hands or their backs or their hips, any joint in Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Terry, God's given you something. If someone you have a mental um, lack of clarity that's noticeable to other people, you're very fearful. God's healing that for you right now. You're, that sharpness is coming back in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.